Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm Jane Goodman, Public Health Strategist with the Nashua Division of Public Health and Community Services. And I'm happily joined today by Jan Valuk, who is a strategist. Director for, of Strategy, yeah. <laughs> Director of Strategy, my long memory here. <laughs> Director of Strategy for the National Prevention Coalition. Correct. Um, which is um, operated out of the United Way of yes. Greater Nashua. Mm -hmm. uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us to talk about what the Prevention Coalition is doing and how it started. So let's start with that. Um, you were not always um, the strategy director for the Prevention Coalition. Prior to this, what were you doing? Prior to this, I was a school teacher in Nashua. I taught health education at um, Elm Street Middle School, and then I moved up to the high school, and I retired after a, a total of about 21 years in the district um, in, back in 2013. So. And how long did that retirement last? Um, about a year. <laughs> so I've been, um, even while I was teaching, I was involved in um, prevention, primarily tobacco prevention. I started mm -hmm. with Dr. Albie Budnitz. Um, the coalition's been around since about 2009. And um, then we combined and we, and we kind of covered all areas. Mm -hmm. So in um, October, end of September, beginning of October uh, 2013, we, um, we, we, we received a drug-free community grant from the White House. Mm -hmm. So that gave us $125,000 a year for five years. We reapplied and got it for five more years. So that ends in um, sep end of September 2023. So sustainability is our big thing right now. So we're strategizing as a coalition, trying to figure out how we're going to sustain ourselves to do the work that we do. And what was the, how was the grant composed? Like what were your, what were you charged with, with this federal grant? So we had to come up with um, a lot of different uh, programs that we wanted to run, you know, the action plan, you know, why, what is the problem? Uh, what are some of the, the statistics in regards to it? You know, the but whys and the but whys here, mm -hmm. and then come up with um, in, within the action plan to how we were going to address that. So right off in the very beginning, we started with, and it was when the um, opioid crisis was starting and a lot of young people were getting medications out of their parents or grandparents or friends' medicine cabinets. Mm. So we started with what we called the Lock It Up campaign. And we created videos and different programs to go out. And actually, we went to a lot of seniors. So we went to both hospitals. We went to a lot of the senior housing facilities. We, um, Officer uh, Jane Constant from the police department, we participated in her program to get the information out to all of the seniors that, you know, locking up their medications or and or disposing of them properly when they weren't using them. So we participate mm -hmm. in drug take back days that are held twice a year with the DEA right. and the Which we just had a we just a had a couple it. weeks ago. Yeah, or last we collected week. we collected um, thirteen boxes and over three hundred pounds of just in Nashua. Mm, that's great. So we were there. We don't do the collecting. The police department does the collecting, and but we handed out resource bags with all kinds of information from different agencies in Nashua that we that we work with mm -hmm. so and there are t permanent drug take back boxes in the city as well um, Walgreens and CVS the police department has a permanent one mm -hmm. the hospitals the hospitals them. both have permanent ones so you can go in and drop your medications off at any time mm -hmm. so so um, what is your major focus now um, at the coalition. So we've kind of, you know, we've um, added a few things here and there depending on what, you know, has presented itself as being a, an issue. And, and I guess I probably should just explain that, you know, we work on uh, preventing alcohol, tobacco, and drug use among youth mm -hmm. in, in Nashua. So we're only in Nashua. Um, we have partner coalitions throughout the state um, that do a lot of the same work that we do. Um, and our you know, our focus and in, in our little motto is, you know, healthy um, kids grow healthy communities. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want the Nashua area to be healthy and by preventing substance misuse and that kind of thing um, among youth is very important. So we've worked on um, alcohol 
and um, tobacco prevention. Um, the last couple of years we've really focused on vaping because that's been a huge mm -hmm. problem in the schools. Um, we start, we've started a couple of campaigns due to COVID. Uh, we couldn't get into the schools. That was huge that we weren't able to um, you know, go in and do presentations. They weren't in school for the longest right. time. And even now that they are, the teachers are just barely surviving. Um, doing what they need to do, never mind adding in right. us. And we Taking can't, class, we can't yeah. go in anyway. They're not letting people from outside come in. Right. So we started what we called this, um, the Sunshine Project, mm -hmm. um, where we uh, came up with a, uh, a yard sign that said, what are you doing to be the sunshine in someone's life? Just because, you know, back in May and June of last year, everybody was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? We're home, we can't go out, we can't do anything. And we just saw that, you know, mental health issues were starting to mm -hmm. probably become a major concern. So we just had these yard signs. We put them out all over the city. We, ha we gave them out at the, at the farmer's market over the summer. Um, we had a, a day down at the United Way office that they could come and pick them up just to get people to smile. And there's people who will still say, oh, yeah, I remember that sign. It just mm. put a smile on my face and reminded me that I really needed to reach out to other people um, to help helpfully make a better day for them. Mm -hmm. Then in the, um, after Christmas, we started um, what we called the connectedness campaign. Mm -hmm. So we had small pizza boxes, plain ones, that we purchased, and we filled them with all kinds of crafting materials markers and glitter glue and buttons and pom-poms and then mm -hmm. um, some uh, popsicle sticks. So we distributed them to the people that were meeting in person. Um, not a whole area, a lot of places got them because there weren't a lot that were in person, mm -hmm. but we handed the boxes out. I think we gave out over a hundred initially and explained that and we had the instructions in both English and Spanish um, to bring the box home and decorate it and then on the popsicle sticks, write down some of the things that you wanted to do, either during the pandemic or after the pandemic, mm -hmm. that you could do as a family to be connected. Um, so we're hoping to expand on that now that I know that we were planning on giving them to the, um, the 21st century program that is um, in this after school in a number of the schools in mm -hmm. Nashua. We'll probably reach out to PAL and Boys and Girls Club and see if they need any more. So, you know, again, just trying to keep that connection and, and positivity mm -hmm. in people's lives. So, so I, you have quite a bit of history in Nashua I as a teacher. <laughs> and so uh, how have the problems changed from when you were in high school teaching health education, you're working on smoking cessation, um, that was the big issue du jour. How has it changed? That I mean, besides smoking to vaping, you know, we know that, but... Right. Well, the big change is that we got the word out about tobacco and smoking and how dangerous mm -hmm. it was, and, and that, that went way down among youth. The numbers mm, like, never went to zero, but it was like we would go into classes, and even when I was teaching my own classes, they were all like, oh, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. The kids got the message, right? And then we had the whole vaping issue. So within two years, now we're looking at um, not epidemic proportions, but a huge number of youth, more than 50% in some cases of youth that are now using vaping materials. Mm. And it basically went, even within the last few months, from this device, which was called a jewel. Mm -hmm. So kids referred to it as jeweling. The right. jewel it is- It has its own verb now. Yes, it's, it's, yes, it's, a, it's a name brand. Mm -hmm. Well, jewels have gone down on the scale and um, disposables have gone up. And I just talked with um, one of the administrators at Nashua South this morning. She's a good friend of mine. I worked there um, for quite a few years. And she said, yeah, the big, the big concern right now is the disposables because so they can go in. And she's only, since they've been in school for now going on two and a half weeks full time, she's only caught one person using in the school, um, but it's harder now because you have to catch them in the act because mm -hmm. they'll go into the bathrooms, use it, dispose of it, and then there's no proof. Right, and it's not a smoky 
Um, it doesn't. People, a, it doesn't smell smoky. Sometimes it's fruity, it, cotton it candy, yep. mango I hear is very popular. Yep, they've got some, some good flavors available. Um, and it's not a smoke, it's a vapor. Mm -hmm. So it dissipates, but there are chemicals in that vapor that can be very harmful. Absolutely. So it's, everybody thinks it's a safe alternative. There's no such thing as a safe alternative to tobacco. It does contain nicotine. Um, each pod is, I think, equivalent to 10 cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So if they're going through a, a pod a day, it's, it's like almost yeah, a half I thought a, it was a full pack. Yeah, it, yeah, I think you're right. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to remember now. I haven't yeah, full disclosure, I used to work for Breathe. Yes, I know. So, <laughs> so, so thank you for the correction. So I do so, have those vape Yes, vape one things, pod yeah. is the equivalent of a pack. So if you're using a pod a day, it's the equivalent of smoking a pack a day. And what they're seeing is that um, youth that are using vapes um, are much more likely to go to regular cigarettes. Right. And then you have the dual users that are using vape and the combustible cigarettes. Plus, they're, they're vaping more than just the nicotine pods. They're mm -hmm. vaping marijuana. Mm. So that's a whole other story that many whole, of them yeah. are utilizing um, it's called the dab it's pens. dabs. Yeah, they're using different forms of marijuana in the actual pen, mm -hmm. the vaping pen. And that can be very dangerous because you oh, just don't sure. even know what's in the marijuana. Right. Where you know, it's it's not regulated in yeah. any way. And and um, the fact that I mean, yes, it's it's legal for therapeutic reasons in New Hampshire. We are still not legalized for recreational use, but just the fact that it's considered a therapeutic treatment. Um, has the perception of risk has gone way down. Mm -hmm. So usage has gone way up mm. of, uh, of marijuana products. So, and, and you know, it's not, a, it's not a safe drug, especially for a developing brain. Right, so tell me a little bit more about that. So, you know, I understand, and I've just let our audience understand too. You know, I understand we don't want to have that nicotine addiction. We don't want to open up that pathway in the brain that could leave you open to other mm -hmm. um, potential addictions yep. and potential use of um, even more harmful substances. It's not an automatic, but it, it is something to really be concerned about. So, um, you know, why do we want to get rid of that nicotine addiction? Among youth, or well, or, I guess I would say among youth. Yeah, let's start there. I mean, because our... because again, their de their brain is not developed mm -hmm. until they are twenty five, um, which everybody thinks at eighteen you're an adult, you can make your own decisions. You're not a very good decision maker at eighteen, mm -hmm. and it affects the part of your brain that concentrates on decision making and, and impulsivity, and it just it gives you that a little bit of a buzz, so that you know you're just looking for more. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does, you know, it's always been, everybody seems to think that alcohol is the gateway drug, but if you talk to Dr. Albie Budnitz, and I'll give him a big shout out because yeah. he's been working in this area for, <laughs> for a, a long, long time, time. <laughs> um, it, it, tobacco is the, is the original gateway drug. Mm -hmm. And when you've got, you know, you know, the age of onset at 10 and 11 years old mm -hmm. of trying, um, you know, I could try a cigarette and maybe, maybe smoke a pack, mm -hmm. maybe I'm not gonna become addicted. But a young person smokes a, a half a pack or a pack, that addiction starts so fast, mm -hmm. so. And people don't realize, I mean, so it's one thing if you're using the vape, but then if you go to that combustible cigarette, the smoke, and the yeah. detrimental effects of cigarette smoking. Right. And I, I hammer this home all the time in the work I do at the Division of Public Health, mm -hmm that smoking really is enemy number one yeah. still. It causes cancer, it causes heart disease, yeah. it complicates diabetes. Yeah. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but... Complicates the effects of COVID? Yeah, it does. Smokers are having a harder yeah. time, even vapors. Right. They, I've read an article about. And everybody thinks that this is just water mm -hmm. in the vape? It's not. There's all kinds of chemicals in there. Mm -hmm to the point where you can develop, you know, a, what they're calling popcorn lung because your lungs look like popcorn when they look mm -hmm. at them. Um, you know, there's chemicals that you, you really shouldn't be putting into your body. The only thing you should put in, I mean, you eat and you drink, but anything after that, the only thing that should be going in is the air that you breathe. Right, the oxygen yep. that we, 
Yeah, so I mean, it's very concerning. So that is one of your number one areas yeah, that you're looking we, at. Yeah, and we've kind of fallen a little bit behind in the last year because we haven't been able to get into the schools, but mm -hmm. we're hoping to get back in there and and start. We've, we've done sessions for parents at open houses, and, and we go into the health classes. Of course, being a former health teacher, that's mm -hmm. at the top of my list. But we've gone in and, and uh, talked with the students and have them do just little informal surveys with the you know the number of kids that are using, and it's even in among sophomores, it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. But the good news is there's a whole bunch that still think it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> I know my son is one of them. Yeah. Because he said he, they'll do it in the bathroom. So right. He, it smells like rich cotton candy when yep. you walk in. I can't yep. stand it. Right. Um, so that's interesting when you speak to the parents, because I know that from some of our uh, research at Breathe, for example, a lot of the parents were like, well, it's better than smoking. Right. It's better than smoking. And we really have to you know, disabuse people of that notion that exactly. this is a good substitute. It's not a good substitute. It's just replacing one addiction with another right. addiction. And it's nicotine. It's nicotine. It's, it's still the same nicotine. Product. Right. And nicotine is one of the most addictive substances out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, I don't, I don't understand a lot of the parents. I know that you know, one of the former administrators up at North that was a, f a student of mine, she said she, you know, they confiscate, if they catch you, they confiscate the device. Well, the parent came in all up in arms because they don't give the devices back. And, and that was expensive. And she paid, the parent paid for it. Right. So there's, again, the misconceptions that we need to, to get out there. And, you know, the same thing is in dealing with alcohol. Now we're approaching prom and, and graduation. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge problem with, um, you know, they're 18, maybe 19, and they're not legal to buy alcohol, mm -hmm. but a lot of parents are buying it for their kiddos, saying, oh, I'd rather have them um, be, you know, get it for them and have them be in one place and be safe. But it's, what message are you sending? Right, right. It's just yeah. like you wouldn't let someone drive before they have their license. Why would you let them drink before they, right. you know, legally allowed to do so? And if, and if you're promoting them to break that law, how many other laws are they going to break? right. Yeah. Well, that's a good uh, reminder for us of some good um, safe tips for prom mm -hmm. and for graduation. Uh, besides, you know, obviously keep the alcohol locked up. Yep. Um, I know that I, I have a graduating senior this year, so um, we're going to have a nice outdoor gathering mm -hmm. um, to be safe with the times. Yep. And I, I did have that realization. I'm like, I can't have any alcohol at the party, even though I'll be having some adult friends over that want to wish my kids well. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, there's a, this is a dry party. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's really important for parents right. to remember that you really can't even take that risk. Yeah. If you're going to have a celebration and you're, you know, do it safely. And safely is not just outdoors. Safely is no alcohol. Yeah. Have Coke, <laughs> you know, yeah. Pepsi, whatever you prefer. But yeah. really, the alcohol needs to be left inside. Right. And, and just, you know, the imp I mean, it's all over the, the news and everything about young people that are involved with alcohol-related car crashes. And, you know, the first funeral that I went to for a former student that was the passenger in the car where supposedly keys were taken and hidden so they couldn't get them. Well, they found the keys and off they went. And down on 495 in Massachusetts, she oh, was killed. I'm and it was like, yeah. it, you know, and so many, and I have fr close friends who have lost their children to alcohol-related um, incidents and they were not 21 they were getting it from someone else so you know think about the consequences before you so readily um, supply the alcohol to your to your children mm -hmm. yeah and because we think about um, what you had said before that the brain isn't fully developed until about 25 years old yeah. and so those decisions so you talk about impaired judgment just from the age that you are and then impairing that with alcohol mm -hmm. it's just really overall a bad decision yeah um you know we have enough impaired judgment yeah. we don't need to enhance it yeah um so it's just really an important reminder and also for prom um you know for the proms that are hopefully happening safely mm -hmm. um to remind kids and their parents again you know alcohol is just a bad idea in this yeah. mix yeah and a lot of parents have said to me when i've had my open houses or, you know, parent-teacher conferences, well, you know, I don't know if my kid's drinking and I'm always asleep by the time they get home, so I don't know if they've had anything to drink. And I said, well, go to bed in their bed. Mm -hmm. They'll need to come and wake you up to get into bed mm. and you'll know if they've been drinking. I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> 
their kids may not be happy about it, but no, but you know, yeah, that you have to you have to be involved. Yeah. You have to stay vigilant. You know, it's it's a full time job. Yeah, being a parent it, and absolutely, you know, you can't take your foot off the brake. You just because it's graduation or they can drive and a rite of passage, as they call it, to yeah. drink. It's like no, that's not a right. No, it's a wrong so of much. passage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then also you have kids that are, you know, hopefully taking off to colleges where there is a little bit more freedom and to remind them, too, that, yeah. you know, the binge drinking and the, yeah. the excessive drinking is really unhealthy, right. unhealthy for your liver, unhealthy for how you feel the next day. You yeah. know, you are you have responsibility in, in college to do your work, yeah. um, you know, to take that seriously. Right. So. That's the mom in me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> It'll come out in me as well. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been having those talks. Um, so you had one other thing you told me about before the show, the Get Home Safe campaign that I think you started during COVID. Yes, we did. And we were, because we had heard that, you know, the reports were that alcohol consumption among adults was also increasing. And we're always very concerned about, you know, making sure people get home safely. I've always been my children's, my children, my young men who are now adults. Um, I've been their designated driver, so mm -hmm. um, when they've gone out to different bars, if they were back home celebrating. So what we, what we have is we have about five restaurants in the downtown area that um, we have a, a, uh, a sticker on the door. It says, get home safe. And if you go in and tell them and say, you know, there's four of us that are going for dinner or a, par a gathering, and if you identify yourself as the designated driver, they will serve you a soft drink for free. Nice. So that, you know, you can then, now you are responsible for getting the rest of the, the group that you're with home. And that's so important. Yeah. Like, that's, it's, a, it's a small thing that restaurants can do, but they don't. They don't need to be liable either. Right. And they, and they said, well, you know, that's our main focus is making sure because they don't want to be sued. Um, but this way, it just isn't a better way to, you know, at least offer them the, the free beverage. And um, then, it, then they can hopefully carry through and not have any problems. Yeah. That's and we're going to reach out to more restaurants as the weather starts getting nicer and people are starting to open up more. Right. But, and they should be opening up more. Yeah. And there's a lot of outdoor seating downtown in Nashville, which is really yep. a welcome sight. Yep. Unless you're in your car driving through. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little complicated. I love it. <laughs> so we do have prevention week. Um, so just run through all of those to make sure we, you know, we, you're the prevention coalition. So yep. make sure we hit on on Mondays, we have preventing prescription drug and opioid misuse. And mm -hmm. we talked about, um, you know, locking up your prescription drugs, yeah. your medication, and disposing of them, the unused portion. And there's yes. drop boxes all over the city, yeah. all the local, even in the region, we, all the local police departments have a drop box. Uh, preventing underage drinking and alcohol, we just mm -hmm. really talked about that quite a bit. Um, preventing illicit drug use on Wednesday and youth marijuana. Mm -hmm. So um, talk to me just a tiny bit about marijuana, because that is... So that's become, uh, again, because of the um, legalization for therapeutic marijuana, the, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a medicine. So the whole perception of risk has gone down, and there's a whole lot of parents that will say, well, I smoked it when I was their age, and I'm okay, mm -hmm. but it's not the same marijuana. The marijuana that my generation smoked when, when we were in our teens and 20s was about five to six percent THC, mm -hmm. which is the active ingredient that gets you high. Now it's closer to up over 50 to 60 percent THC. So it's it's really a much stronger marijuana than what was out there. And, you know, all of these edibles, you, you'll get a, a if you get an edible that's like a chocolate chip cookie and it'll on the back of it, it'll say one serving size, not the whole cookie, just mm. a quarter of the cookie. Well, who's going to eat just a quarter of that delicious right. chocolate chip cookie? So they're That's putting like the them whole in... dieting thing. Yeah, yeah, if you don't read the serving size, yeah, you really they're, get they're really in putting trouble. themselves in danger. And then of Thursday, we have preventing youth tobacco use yep. and vaping. We talked about that. And then um, Friday, we have um, preventing suicide. Yeah, which is a really tough topic. I'm not sure if the Prevention Coalition is delving into that. Or oh, absolutely. Just part of Mental health is huge right now. We, we work on um, the adverse childhood experiences that mm -hmm. are out there, you know, ACEs, the different things that you um, have in your life that could potentially put you at risk for um, potentially suicide or um, substance misuse. So um, mental health is huge right now, and we are. That's what the connectedness program mm -hmm. is for. That was what the Sunshine Project was for, just to try to get people to focus on the positive and and most importantly in regards to 
and I was on the radio show with uh, Bobby Bagley this morning. We talked about the stigma around mental health and mental illness, mm -hmm. where you might go off, um, you know, for a bike ride and you fall and you hit your head or you cut yourself. What do you, what do your parents do? The first thing they do, they'll take you to the emergency room. Whereas if you're suffering from depression or suicidal tendencies, you're afraid to go ask anybody. You're like, oh, I can do this. I'll figure it out myself. Mm -hmm. it's, but mental health is as important, if not more important, than sometimes physical health. Mm -hmm. And we've seen so much, oh, I want to say, like regression, yeah. so to speak, of yeah. services and yeah. um, people really staying away, um, not being able to go in for their, you know, their yeah. counseling sessions or therapy sessions or support groups. Right. And, We've really moved to this virtual model, yeah. at least for now. And so, you know, hopefully as we begin to open up and people get vaccinated and they can get back in yeah. um, and regain that trust with their providers to um, to really um, seek those services right. and get the help that they need. Because yeah. there's no shame in it. This, these are difficult times. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask for help. You, you have to be able to, everybody needs it at some point in their life. Yeah. Well, I agree. Well, on that note, Jan, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Jane, for having me. I really appreciate your time, and I'll let you get back to your, to your grandchildren. Yes. And, <laughs> and all that's good in the world. So right. thank you, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, yes, you too. <laughs> thank you. And we'll be right back with our next guest. I got vaccinated to help protect my family and friends. I'm getting vaccinated because it's a first step for our community to go back to normal life. I'm getting vaccinated because I want to protect my friends, my family, and everyone else in the community. I've been vaccinated because I want to visit our daughter Caroline and her two kids, and because I want to keep our entire national community safe. We got vaccinated so we can be together. I got vaccinated because we needed change. We needed to go back to how things were before and this is how we do it. Olá, eu tomei minha vacina para minha própria saúde, para meu bem, próprio bem-estar, também para minha família, proteger minha família, principalmente os meus netos, e também para continuar com a minha comunidade, voltar à minha vida normal. We are getting vaccinated because it's necessary for the safety of us and the members of our church. Al vacunarnos, rompemos esa cadena de dolor y muerte producida por el COVID-19. Mes chers amis, je vous invite a venir vous vacciner. Moi, je me suis déjà vacciné. Pourquoi je me suis fait vacciner? Niko hapa kuasihi, mpate chanjo, chanjo ya COVID-19, ili turudi tulivokuwa kabla ya virusi. Pata chanjo. I got vaccinated for you. And I got vaccinated for you. So roll up your sleeve, Nashua, and let's get vaccinated. Welcome back to Public Health Matters. I'm joined now by our community health worker, Nellie Kashahu. Welcome, Nellie. Thank you for having me. So we're so glad you could come. We have lots to talk about. Yes. Uh, you joined the division in, was January. it? In January. Yeah. And you came on as a community health worker. So. Tell me where you were before and um, what you were doing before and what drew you to come work with us? Oh, wow. Um, so before I got this job, I worked as a residential counselor in Massachusetts. It's a Communitas, that's mm -hmm. the company. And so we basically just do the day-to-day -day activities with people um, with disabilities, with mental health. It, issues and old age. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing that for six years and it has been the best and most fulfilling thing ever, you know. Oh, honesty. that's great. Um, seeing just individuals being happy, doing mm -hmm. the most basic thing, you know, and it just gives me joy. That's why I stayed for six years. And now that I'm looking into going to like public health in itself, I decided, you know what, I need a change, I need growth, mm -hmm. um, and this job opened up and I just went for it. And we're so glad you did. <laughs> I'm happy I did too. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so you started in January and it was part of a grant that the public health department got around the COVID response yes. and um, really reaching out to um, different communities. Yeah. 
um, to help really bring people back, um, bring people in for vaccination, for testing yeah. around COVID. And now as we start to see some of our numbers decline, it's really getting people back in to see their mental health providers, to get their regular preventive um, care and all of those things. Yeah. So how has it been so far? You've been mostly working on COVID yes. and COVID Oof. vaccine clinics. Yes. And I, I have to give you a shout out because uh, one of our equity clinics uh, last week, yeah. uh, a woman was registering and she said, I wasn't going to come, but yeah. <laughs> but I got a call from this nice young lady, yeah. and it was you. Yeah. So just really, that's just amazing. You're already having a big impact because really, we're at the point now where the people that are going to get vaccinated have mm -hmm. been vaccinated or have their appointments. Yeah. And now we really have to start going after some of these hard to reach populations and people that are hesitant and they need some talking into. Yeah. So how's that going? Oh, wow. It has been a journey. So the first time we started um, just reaching out to people, I wanted to focus more on my community because mm -hmm. there's a lot of hesitancy around it. And I needed to find people who have the grasp in the community, like mm -hmm. they're there. Um, it was a little bit hard because I had to dive into like Massachusetts a little bit to mm -hmm. reach people who are here because we're not that many around Nashua area. Mm -hmm. So it, got, it did work. <laughs> <laughs> so that lady is actually one of the first ladies I ever talked to. And that was in like March when oh, we were okay. starting out. She was against it. She had concerns that were valid due to um, her being in certain situations. And mm -hmm. she's seen people like just question the vaccine or any other vaccine. Um, but it's been what, like three months down the line and she came back, she gave me a call and I was like, wow. It's funny enough, I didn't even have to call her again to, mm -hmm. to like sign her up. She did it by herself, mm -hmm. I gave her all the flyers, the information that I got, and didn't want to really force the vaccine on mm -hmm. her. I wanted her to make a, a decision when she's ready, and that panned out. And from her doing that, a lot of Kenyans came on board too. Mm -hmm. So she opened up a lot of people like That's mine. great. Yeah. It's really word of mouth word and of reaching, mouth. reaching someone who can really be a champion for it as well. That's true. So you mentioned that you are from Kenya originally. Yes, I am. And so is there a large Kenyan community? And not so much in Nashua, but you know, even south of the border. There um, is. <laughs> uh, Kenyans are mostly like in the low area mm -hmm. then all the way out to like Worcester. Okay. Um, so we like, that's little Kenya we like to say. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. <laughs> But that's that's why I wanted to focus on that, because even our churches, a lot of them are like around that area. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just a lot. You wouldn't even tell. I've gotten people tell me that like you can't really t tell a Kenyan from uh, an African-American, if, mm -hmm. I, if I should say. So like it's been, oh, wow. Um, I don't know. Like, but it, it, it kind of worked out because I knew of people and mm -hmm. know the area. So it did help a little bit, mm -hmm. or much, I should say. And have you been able to reach people in the Nashua area too? The Nashua, yes, because most of them are older generations that go to church and the oh, young okay. kids also signed up. Um, they, funny enough, the younger ones did more than the older ones, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, I don't know, maybe because of just being open mm -hmm. and reading and all that. Um, I know... African households and parents are very strict in, you know, in their ways. So mm -hmm. it would be like, I don't want to get all these new things in my body or mm -hmm. this, I don't know what it is, so I don't want it. And they're right. very um, holistic, some of them, very mm -hmm. natural. I'm like, I'll just take ginger every morning, a shot, like stuff like that. They mm -hmm. make like ginger and lemon and all yeah. that. So they'd rather do that every morning. And that's it. So the younger crowd kind of pushed the older crowd to come in. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, going to Kenya right now, you need the vaccine. So that kind of mm -hmm. brought a lot of people in too. Right, um, and Kenya's having a, a very difficult problem right now. They are. Right now it's it's worse than it was when it started. Mm -hmm. um, the the countries on, some, some places are doing like curfews and all that, and it's just a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so they're going through some really difficult times. Yes, yes, they are. So you did mention churches, mm -hmm. and so that has been a big strategy um, with the public health department and all the wonderful community health workers that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell me a little bit more about like you know going through the churches because that's such a great place where people have trust. Yeah. Um, um, so going to churches was not um, also easy, I would say due to the fact that um, some of them have very strong beliefs um, in the sense of, you again, you, you don't want to put anything else in your body. Mm -hmm. Like, if the Bible says so and stuff like that. So it was, it was a matter of um, reaching out to the pastor, talking to them, only to find out they also got it. So it was easy to work hand in hand mm -hmm. to have him, like, talk to his congregation and give them the information. Mm -hmm. um, I've always told myself it's not me wanting to like force the vaccine on people. So mm -hmm. information has been really important. It's been key. The knowledge behind it has also been like important. So that's what I pushed. Mm -hmm. um, and once they found out more about this stuff or have their question answered, mm -hmm. they came willingly and it just worked out. <laughs> so what other concerns? Now, you mentioned they don't want to put anything into their bodies, you know, that's not necessary. Yeah. And, you know, interestingly enough, there was someone in our office that said that recently. Yeah. And and we countered, we, I should say Bobby countered, <laughs> you know, I don't put anything in my body either unless it's necessary. But mm -hmm. this is necessary mm -hmm. because it's much worse to have COVID than to have the vaccine. The vaccine okay. And so what what other deep concerns do, do people in your community have? Is there anything we can dispel right now that? So the another thing that came up a lot was the um the time that it took for the vaccines to come out mm -hmm. um it's very quick some say it's um they're not even sure with they're probably experimenting with us mm. um it's gonna cause like infertility and so those are like the main things too the uncertainty of what this vaccine can do to me mm -hmm. like i mean it's there and um covid just started like a year ago why is it like it's too soon Right. You know, so that was like the number one reason I would say that caused like um, the hesitancy around it. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> and now I have to admit that that was a concern for me, too. Yeah. You know, I thought, wow, that's quick. Yes. You know, they're pushing this through. And unfortunately, some of this became political. So there Very. was a lot in the news. <laughs> yeah. But then when I really sat and did the research about this, you mm -hmm. know, I realized almost 20 years have gone into these mRNA vaccines. It was a technology that was developed o over 10 years ago and kind of sat on a shelf. Mm -hmm. So um, in some ways, it's very exciting times. Um, you know, it, they're hard times. I'm not going to deny that. But the, the miracle of this being able to be used in the way it has and being rolled out. Um, and... Another thing I was just reading about, too, was like this whole idea of emergency authorization and what that means. Yeah. And I think the word emergency tends to be a little off-putting for people. But really, um, there are a lot of very standard, strict criteria in order to approve a vaccine. A vaccine. And there are just thousands and thousands of people in these clinical trials and reviewing the research and looking for side effects and looking to see if they've developed the antibodies. Yeah. So these still were put through rigorous trial as soon as, and they were able to come to market, or I should say come to market, they were able to be utilized quickly because they did sit on a shelf yeah. and they were developed. I was just finding what to add to that, and, yeah. but the way the messenger RNA was developed, that science. So um, hopefully we can dispel that, that there yeah. were, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> you know, um, hopefully your community's watching right now and yeah. they <laughs> yeah. And it's another thing, too. I was not a believer, if I should say. I talked to you mm -hmm. about it. And I was like, I am not doing it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and <laughs> we talked to you into yeah, it. Now. <laughs> and it was like, OK, you know what? I really need to start thinking about this thing. Mm -hmm. I read on it like once. Wasn't sold. Why? Just because of the the time factor about it. Then when now I got uh, a positive COVID test, I was like, you know what? I don't never want to feel like this ever again. It was the worst time. Like now that I'm thinking back, it was the worst time, like shortness of breath or 
Okay, like, so you're getting way ahead. No, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was like, gonna, I was just going to lead into that <laughs> because that was an interesting development. You yeah. started working in January. By the end of January, mm -hmm. you know, you tested positive for COVID. Yes. And you yes. did experience it. Yeah. Um, so you did. So tell me, you were short of breath. Sh yeah, shortness of breath. The fatigue was like so bad, like never before. I've never felt so tired in my life like mm -hmm. that. Um, and um, I, I could feel headaches here and there. Then I got the loss of taste and smell. Mm. But the shortness of breath was it for me. That was one like I could not do my laundry and I'm not even moving far. So mm -hmm. I was like, this is not it. I don't want to feel like this. Mm -hmm. I started reading into like the the vaccines, the mRNAs and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I finally settled and I was like, you know what? I'm going to get it. I will. And the rest is history because mm -hmm. like I have the information. I did look for the information through like trusted sources. So it's not one of those WhatsApp groups that people send you and you're scared. So I stopped mm -hmm. even looking at those. So every time I got any new information, I would run off and ask questions or just go online and find a uh, trusted resource mm -hmm. to, to base my, you know, confident in and be like, you know what, this is good. After after that, I had my partner. I was like, you know what, we, we are getting it. I did the research. I could <laughs> I could. I, I talked him into doing so. I told him he's the information. Was he hesitating also? He was very hesitant. So he did it too. And now we're like, thank God. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Um, then we just try and keep safe. And was it just you that got COVID in your family or did Oh, it? wow. Um, so my partner did end up getting it. Um, but around that time, it was just me, um, him and my sister that mm -hmm. got it. My mom had gotten it way before, like last year. Mm -hmm. um, then it, that was it. Mm -hmm. Nobody else in the house got it. So. And how did your other family members fare with it? They were, they were okay. We try to keep our distance. Everybody mm -hmm. did good um, in doing what was supposed to be done for those 10 days. And they were very supportive. They looked after me. And yeah, they were just there for mm -hmm. anything that I needed. And th that time, it was like... My dad was like, don't even come out of your room and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm like, you know, thank you. Because I would have probably just gone to the other room, not even <laughs> thinking about it. Because it's so not normal to be in one space for yeah. a long time. So you're like, oh, but they helped me out a lot. Good, they good. Did. Yeah. So one thing we were talking about before the show was that having long-term effects from COVID-19. Yeah. And that's something you indicated, that even after you recovered, after your 10-day isolation, mm -hmm. quarantine, uh, you were feeling better, you were back to work, you started to notice something. So tell me what you noticed. You told me about walking yeah. from the parking garage. Mm -hmm. or So after my 10-day isolation, I'm, I'm walking from the garage to the office, and I'm like, wait a minute, like, shortness of breath. And I'm like, whoa, okay, this is not good. So mm -hmm. it keeps on happening, and I keep mentioning to like my my parents, and and they're like, you should probably go get checked out uh -huh. or something, cause you could walk. I knew my capabilities and how far I could walk, but this time it was not even far. Like literally, I take the stairs, especially like going up. It was it, and mm -hmm. from there, I booked an appointment, and they did tell me that um, COVID has like lingering effects. Like you will just have, po they call it post-acute COVID syndrome. Okay. And <laughs> so I got there and I'm like- Hacks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I get there and I'm like, what? Yeah, and it's a it's a thing. So I'm like, is that really, it's happening to <laughs> people? You're not messing people? with me, are yeah. you? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it's actually a real thing. People are going through the effects of COVID pretty like longer it might not be the same um symptoms yeah but or intensity maybe yeah intensity um but for me now the shortness of breath became more like I would say not serious but I could I, I could not do the same things mm -hmm. at all and I could feel like a like a tightness mm -hmm. and quickly I'm like no so once I went in the first time they did like a like I think a stress test, mm -hmm. and they, they did see that I'm getting tired way sooner. 
I left and I got an inhaler. So now I'm depending on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, like, it just wears off, they said. They, mm -hmm. it, it can. Um, the fatigue, you get extremely tired. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. So one thing after another... And all these tests that I had to do, I'm still currently doing some more just so that they could rule out a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. um, um, like where I go to get care, they even have a team that focuses on that because they really want to make sure they're catching everything or just being there throughout um, someone's whole ride or deconditioning, as mm -hmm. they call it, to my normal self. Okay. Um, they offer physical therapy, just breathing exercises. I was like, wow, wow this thing is like, it yeah, did all that's that. serious. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's like a rehab, almost yeah. like a pulmonary rehab. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So it's it's been that. And um, and where are you now with it? Are you doing better or are you still have some effects from it? I'm doing better in the sense of um, it. How am I going to put it? <laughs> I'm doing better in the sense, like, my breathing is not that bad, I would say. Um, it's not yet what it used to be. Mm -hmm. And that's just something I'll probably have to deal with and, like, kind of learn how to deal with. But the breathing is definitely not back. Not where you'd like it to it's be. Not where it was. Um, the Just the respiratory issues, like, even the coughs, they did tell me, like, my coughing right now, too, is not the same. Like, mm -hmm. it, it hurts. Okay. So it's, but it's once in a while. So yeah. it's not a continuous thing. And they, I'm, a, I'm pretty healthy uh, in the sense of I don't do, like, smoke and do all these things. So mm -hmm. they're not really worried about serious things. It's just they have to uh, follow you and make sure you're okay and phase you out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they want to make sure that you can get back to doing and walk, walking from the parking garage to the office at a yeah. minimum, right? You yeah. want to be able to do that. Yeah. That's when you really know something's wrong. <laughs> when there's wrong. just like activities of daily living and you can't, you can't do, do them. It. Yeah. That's what I, I had to like just take that and be like, you know what? I need to talk to somebody because mm -hmm. it's also very common for someone to just, you know what? I'll, it's nothing. <laughs> Right. You know, probably, to delay it. Yeah, you delay it and no, just go check checked out. Mm -hmm. um, if you've had COVID, you know, like just go see somebody about it. Mm -hmm. Now that we know it's. <laughs> yeah, we wrote an article about yeah. it this week. It just, you know, six months out, uh, a lot of people, all ages, yeah. are returning to their, to their physicians uh, with kind of nonspecific complaints. Like, yeah. Uh, Shortness of breath, mm -hmm. difficulty breathing. Some people are are affected. They're having heart conditions, different yeah. things. I think it presents differently in different people. people. Yep. But I think your advice is really sound that you don't want to ignore it or I'll, or I'll be fine. Yeah. I'll be fine. Yeah. And while we're on the topic of ignoring things, I yeah. do want to say, like, people right now, it is spring and allergies are oh. in full bloom. Yeah. But if you say it's just allergies, you're ignoring potential symptoms potential. of COVID. Yeah. Because um, I talk to people, um, you know, when we do our disease investigation and they go, oh, I thought it was allergies and a week goes by and they go, well, these, these are really it's bad more. allergies this year. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to like give a little shout out to people like, you know, don't ignore things. Don't, don't ignore, ignore those it. allergy symptoms or yeah. um, like you said, if you've had COVID and you're recovering, or you've recovered, mm -hmm. but you're having some odd symptoms, you know, that's definitely something to talk to your health care provider about. That's true. Um, you know, because you don't want to go loony either. You just yeah. want to get some clarity that, like, this is a real thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So what are you looking forward to as a community health worker? Um, oh, what's wow. the next step? Um, wow, just growth in terms of um, just learning the field and learning um, how to work with, people you know there's mm -hmm. always something you can learn I, I always say that and I'm just focused on learning and serving my community mm -hmm. I would say um, those are the main focus of my life right now <laughs> well you're doing a great job <laughs> and we you. love having you at the division and Thank working you. with you and mm -hmm. with all the community health workers really it just brings such um a great richness to our, our very small but mighty office. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing your story. Thank you. Um, and giving us some really sound advice about, you know, COVID-19, getting vaccinated, and what to do after COVID, mm -hmm. and how it affected you. So thank you, Nellie. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Again, we do have weekly COVID testing from 3 to 4.30 in the Elm Street parking garage. You can make an appointment online or you can call our hotline at 589-3456. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend.